Okay, so tonight, Bezra Sashem, we're going to be continuing beyond the written ending of Rabbi Nachman's story of the seven beggars, of the Shiva Habat Laram. And we're going to enter into territory that I wasn't even sure I wanted to enter into, but when I asked my Rebbe, he recommended very strongly that we enter into the territory. Now, what we're going to be talking about is difficult because it's a phantom space of sorts. It's a space that's carved out by Rabbeinu. It's carved out by Rabbi Nachman. But it's carved out in such a way that it's an empty engraving. Because throughout the entire Misa, from the beginning, from the two narrative framings, from the king who desired to offer kingship to his son in the lifetime of the king, on the condition that the prince who's receiving the kingship from his father in the lifetime of his father would hold on to joy even when he descends away from Malchus, even when the comfort and the kingship and the rulership and the power that is given over to this prince, even when he loses it, the command is to remain besimcha. That is the condition. And then the second framing of the narrative tells us about how after this prince begins to fall and begins to fail in the promise that he made to his father, and he begins to fall into despondency and into sadness and into marashchaira and into kfiros and all forms of heresy and loss of hope and loss of faith, we're suddenly thrown into the new frame of the opening of the story, which is the unnamed catastrophe, the trauma, that which happens that sends an entire civilization running into the woods only to leave a young boy and a young girl lost in the woods. And this young boy and this young girl, in their starvation and in their privation and in their destitution, yearn out, they cry out from a place within the soul that is so impoverished that all it can do is scream out. That place that the Zohar HaKadosh refers to as Tfila Liani, based on the Kapitlach of Tehillim that David HaMelech, Malka Mashiach wrote, the prayer of the impoverished individual is the prayer that ascends higher than any other prayer because a prayer that comes from the place of pure destitution, of pure nothingness of the self is a prayer that ascends higher than most. And in response to the prayer of these two lost children who become lost in the heart of the woods, starving, sore, not sure where help is going to come from, helpless, powerless, we encounter our seven enigmatic beggars, these mysterious creatures of the night, these mysterious vagabond individuals who appear deficient in all modes of deficiency. We encounter the blind beggar and we encounter the deaf beggar and we encounter the stuttering beggar and we encounter the crooked necked beggar and we encounter the hunchback beggar and we encounter the handless beggar and we encounter the legless beggar as well. And we're told that each of these beggars, each of these mysterious figures, these creatures of lack, of chisaron, of deficiency and suffering, offer food to the children momentarily. They offer hope to the children only to pull that hope away as the children beg these beggars to stay with them, only to say that we don't want this. We don't want to be with you forever. We simply want to give you sustenance for today. And then we're told that these two begging children who find themselves lost in the woods, in the midst of darkness, after the unnamed catastrophe that takes place, after this unnamed prince whose father made him promise to hold on to hope even when he falls into sadness, and he falls into sadness, we find ourselves encountering these beggars as they grow up, becoming beggars of their own, strong beggars, powerful beggars, powerful in their acknowledgement of their powerlessness. And finally, there's a decision that in the heart of all of this darkness, that there should be a wedding, there should be a joyous day, there should be a celebration, there should be connection between two disparate parts, there should be a union between opposites, there should be an enclosing to that which was separate and that which was left open, however a person wants to conceive of that yichud, that unity that takes place. And where, the beggars ask, should we celebrate a wedding of the lost children? Why, there's no better place than digging a deep pit in the mud, covering it with trash and branches and garbage, and finding a great, great joy 
within that crevice deeply dug into the wet mud of this worldly existence. And as all weddings go, as all chatsunas go, as all celebrations go, there are gifts to be had and there are rewards to be received. And the Sheva Brachos is nothing but the return of these enigmatic beggars, these lost beggars who offered hope to the children as they found themselves in the hopeless pocket of the heart of the night. These beggars return and the Sheva Brachos, only this time they're no longer beggars. This time they say, you thought I was blind, you thought I was deaf, you thought I couldn't speak, you thought I had a crooked neck, you thought I was hunchbacked, you thought I was handless, you couldn't be more wrong. For my deficiency, or what you perceived as a deficiency, or what the world perceives as a deficiency, is nothing but the sight of my strength. For my powerlessness and my deficiency is in truth rooted in the fact that I operate on a level beyond how everybody else is operating. And these six beggars that return for the Sheva Brachos offer their gifts. The blind beggar offers his gift of old age, which is in truth the paradoxical sense of being young and renewing oneself at every moment. And the deaf beggar offers his ability to have a good life, which is rooted in the deafness to the lack of the world. And the stuttering beggar says, learn to speak like me. For in truth, I don't stutter at all because my words are so powerful. They decry and they declare a gratitude to God that this world can't handle. And the crooked neck beggar says, you think I'm crooked necked? Take my gift of breath. Learn how to breathe and learn how to sing like me. And the hunchback beggar says, you think I'm hunchbacked? I'm not hunchbacked at all. Learn how to be empathic like me. Learn how to make yourself small enough to hold more than you can possibly hold. And the handless beggar, which we discussed last week, says, you think I'm handless? You think I'm powerlessness? I'm not powerless at all. But rather my power is reserved for a place that demands more attention, for a place beyond this world. To save the princess, to save the Jewish soul, to save that burning ember of hope and faith that resides in each and every heart. My hands are reserved for pulling the arrows and the poison of this worldliness out of the princess. And it's my hands that appear so deficient and so broken that have the power of entering into the palace of water that can drown anybody. But it's my ability to have power even in a place of powerlessness. And then, like the narrative of the story had gone until then, we expect to hear of the seventh beggar we expect the legless beggar to return. But what we find is silence, utter silence. Now it's important to note that we at least have a framing of what would happen on the seventh day. Because each night of the stories that Rabbi Nachman told of the seven beggars, and again, it's important to remember that this was close to the death of Rabbi Nachman. This was close to Rabbi Nachman's patira from this world, at least, as a result of the inability to breathe, as a result of the magefa that was going on in that time of tuberculosis in his very short life. And every night that Rabbi Nassim and the Hasidim wanted Rabbi Nuhakadosh, wanted Rabbi Nachman ben Fega to continue the story, they would come and they would introduce with reading news stories of the day. And in their conversations, they would spark the spark of imagination within Rabbi Nachman's mind, which led to the next shlav of the story. And Rabbi Nassim tells us, and the Talmidim tell us, exactly what happened after the telling of the sixth story. After Rabbi Nachman finished the story of the sixth night of the handless beggar, the Chevra came together and they started telling Rabbi Nachman about what was going on in the world, the news, the current events, how broken the world was, where there were areas where the world was fixed. Whatever it may have been in that time, it's no different in our time. They began sharing with the Tzadik Yisoyed Oilam, with Rabbi Nachman ben Fega, they began sharing the stories of the day. Ana ve'amar. And Rabbi Nachman answered and he said, Ah, it's interesting because it's clear that the world is already talking about the story of the seventh beggar. They've already begun speaking about the seventh beggar, speaking about the legless beggar. But, Afal Pikain, Lo Sipra, nevertheless, Rabbi Nachman did not tell the story. And we were not meritorious enough to hear it. The Acher Pesach, 
And after that Pesach was over, the last Pesach of Rabbi Nachman's life, when I traveled with Rabbi Nachman to Uman, where eventually Rabbi Nachman would be buried, Rabbi Nachman said that we will not merit to hear the end of the story. We will not merit to hear the tale of the legless beggar until the coming of Mashiach. As it's written over there. So already we have the framing of the story is that Rabbi Nachman hears the news of the world. And he says, ah, the world is already beginning to understand, beginning to speak about the legless beggar. Now, the fact that Rabbi Nachman left his story unfinished, and this is not the only story that's left unfinished, but this is a story where its ending doesn't even begin to appear. By the lost princess, as we said, There's an ending, although the ending that is written is not truly an ending. The ending of the lost princess, as we spoke about in the shir or the talk or the commentary or the musings on the handless beggar, is that besof hotzia, in the end they saved the princess. Eich, how they saved her, we don't know. So at least there's an ending written. But over here, there's not even an ending written. And the fact that in Rabbi Nachman's stories, things were left wide open, for many people who wanted to poke fun at Hasidus, and in particular Hasidus Breslov, referring to them as the Toiter Hasidim, as the dead Hasidim, which as we'll discuss is not only an insult, but it's also a possible bracha, as we're going to see. The dead Hasidim, the Hasidim who are dead. They used to look at these stories and say, look at these foolish tales that have no endings. But at a certain point, and Svi Mark points this out in his wonderful Tikkun of Asepar, Sipurim Chadashim V'yashenim Shabri Nachman of Breslov, the full stories of Rinachman of Breslov, Svi Mark already points out that at a certain point in history, the lack of an ending of the stories was transformed, it was mitapech, from being a deficiency into becoming a strength of the story. That when people look at the stories of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, what they understand most is that they don't offer an ending, that they open up a space of imagination, that they open up a space of wonder. And not only that, but they beckon the reader themselves to participate in the story. It's not a full narrative that is conveyed. There's no closure as we're going to see. But this lack of closure, instead of being seen as a deficiency of the narrative, is rather that path that leads to the side that beckons the reader or the listener of the story into the very story itself. So that we, over 200 years after the story has been told, are still anticipating what the ending might be, are still wondering what the ending might be. And there have been numerous literary responses to the lack of the ending to the lack of the telling of the tale of the legless beggar. One of them, which is incredibly poignant, is brought down by Svi Mark in the Hakdama to his Sefer on the Sipuri Maisios. And the title of this paragraph is Ga'agua Lesipor Shaloi Soper, a yearning and a desire for a tale that has not been told. And what he brings here is a poem from Isaac Menger. Isaac Menger apparently was a Yiddishist of sorts who was a poet who told stories and also told poetry over, who found himself living in the forest as well, in the heart of the forest, abandoned, hopeless, hungry, yearning, uncertain as to where food would come from the next day. But this forest went by a different name. This forest went by the name of Auschwitz or Treblinka or all of the other miserable places where the Jewish people were forced to reveal the irreducible point of hope that exists even in hell. And Isaac Menger wrote a song. He wrote a poem about it. And this poem was called The Seventh Beggar. And what Isaac Menger wrote is as follows. Kabsen Hashvi'i, Seventh Beggar, Siyam Hasipor, Finish the Tale, Anu Hama'amazinim Ha'achronim, We are the last listeners. We are the last ones hearing the tale. Yehudim koirabim loy zachu l'shmoa. So many Jews, so many people in the world have not merited to hear the end of this tale. Lama l'chakos od. Why continue to wait? Kabsen hashvi'i, seventh beggar. 
גם אתה שותק. You're also silent. והעננים מחבבדים והולכים. And the clouds are gathering and they're beginning to follow and they're beginning to occlude the sun. אנו מחכים, we are waiting. ספר, tell the story. שמא יהיה מאוחר מדי. Because perhaps it's going to be too late. מי יהיה המאזינים? Who's going to be left to listen to the end of the story? So we have already a powerful expression throughout the annals of Jewish history. And one of the powerful things about Rabbi Nachman's Sipurim, and Rabbi Nachman understood this, it seems, because Rabbi Nachman decided to tell stories when he felt that his Torah was no longer performing the tikkun, the fixing that they needed to fix. So Rabbi Nachman said, I'm going to start telling tales of ancient days. Why is Rabbi Nachman going to tell tales like we spoke about in the introduction? To awaken the Jewish soul that has fallen into the slumber of 70 years. To awaken the spirit that has fallen into such an unconscious space where Torah no longer awakens it. Where the Torah of the past no longer catches on to the soul to ignite it. Where the Torah of the present no longer has the strength to awaken the soul. But what we must reach hold of is the Torah of the future, the Torah of Atika Stima'a, as Rabbi Nachman describes in the 60th teaching of Lakuta Maharan, the Torah of the ancient days, at times so ancient that it is rooted in the future itself. It's these stories of Atik Yoimen, the Sipuri Maisios Meshanim Kadmonios, these tales of old, from ancient days that awaken that place of ancientness within each and every one of us. The goal of these stories was to awaken even those souls who had no access to the Torah. And we see throughout the annals of Jewish history, secularists and poets who had no connection, at least explicitly to the Torah of Rabbi Nachman, demanding an end to the story, demanding to understand who this legless beggar might be. Now, Within Rabbi Nachman's corpus, within the Torah of Rabbi Nachman, which is a multi-leveled palace of sorts, as Rabbi Nassim describes so powerfully in his Haktama to the Kutim Maharan, that if a person wants to properly understand what the Torah of Rabbi Nachman is, at first they have to utilize the capacity of their imagination to imagine a palace of many, many rooms. And you may enter into one room which seems to have no windows and no exits, only to find the trap door which opens up into a basement, and then that basement somehow leads you to the attic, and the attic leads you to the Marpeset, which has an overview of the entirety of Yerushalayim, only to fall back down into the garbage room, and then to travel or to meander through the hidden pathways of this house to find pockets of energy and despondency and hope. That Rabbi Nachman's Torahs, the Bechinos that Rabbi Nachman brought to us, are a palace, it's a home where a person can get lost in. Now this world of Rabbi Nachman, the world of Rabbi Nachman's teachings, the fantastical and imaginative world that Rabbi Nachman knew so clearly would be a world that we needed to live in in 2020, is filled with different types of Torah. There's Torah that is written, that's what we have in Lakuta Maharan, there are conversations that were recorded, which is what we have in Sicho Saran. There are biographical and autobiographical statements which touch the mystery of who Rabbi Nachman was or what he may have been, as we find in Chaya Maharan. There are the residual effects of Rabbi Nachman's Torah, what we find in his Talmud, Lukutei Halachos and Lukutei Tfilos. There are many different types of stories and different books and forms of teachings that comprise the corpus of Rabbi Nachman. But there's also the untold elements of Rabbi Nachman's corpus, those elements of Rabbi Nachman's Torah which never saw the light of day. There is the Sefer Hanignaz, there is the book of concealment that Rabbi Nachman wrote and commanded his Tamidim to hide, never to see the light of day until the coming of Mashiach. There is the Sefer Hanisraf, there is the book that was written, and then Rabbi Nachman commanded his Talmidim to burn it before his death. So there are books that were written and concealed. There were books that were written and burned. There's the Scroll of Secrets. There's the Megillah Sitarim that Rabbi Nachman wrote about the end of days, which again, Simark has done profound work on trying to uncover. 
all of those elements of Rabbi Nachman's library, the safer that is concealed, the safer that is burnt, the safer that is hidden, at least those were expressed in the world, and then Rabbi Nachman commanded them for them to be drawn back into concealment. There was a revelation, and then there was a hiding which creates a certain psychological sense of hide-and-go-seek. If it was created and it exists in the world, then it's our job on a certain level to be chutzpahdik and to move forward and to uncover them, even though we don't necessarily have access to them. Because when something is present and then hidden and then concealed, <clears throat> at least what we have the ability to do is to be knowledgeable enough and aware enough that we don't know where it is. But then... There's the story of the seventh beggar. The story of the seventh beggar was never told. It wasn't written and concealed. It wasn't told over and then hidden. It wasn't told over and then burnt. It wasn't told over and hidden away in a chest of secrets awaiting a time of revelation. It was never told. It doesn't exist. So what we encounter when we encounter the untold tale of the seventh beggar as my very dear friend and Rebbe Micah tells me, what would have been necessary really for a class like this or for a talk like this would to sit in front of a screen and be silent for 45 minutes. To embrace the fact that there is simply silence here, there's a blank slate here. But nevertheless, we're a dorma chutzaf, we're a chutzpedictor, and it's only through akshanas de kedusha and azas de kedusha and through the holy chutzpah where we push beyond the boundaries of what is permissible and what is not permissible, that will force us to enter into a space of beginning to contemplate a little bit of what this non-ending might mean. What Rabbi Nachman may have wanted from us in saying that, wow, the world has already begun to discuss the seventh beggar, the legless beggar, but I'm not going to tell it. The only time it will be told is when Mashiach arrives. Now, what I want to try and talk about right now is three things, Be'ezra Hashem. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu should be with me that my words don't stumble and that there's no takala that leaves my lips. Because the last thing in the world that I want to pretend to do is to offer an insight into what Rabbi Nachman meant with the seventh beggar. Amir Tzashem, we should know what the seventh beggar is and who it is and what it means when it arrives. But until then, our job, as Micah pointed out, is shtika. So I don't want to, God forbid, move beyond the boundaries of trying to pretend that we know what the tale should be. And there are many people, both secular and religious, who have attempted to tell the tale of the seventh beggar in their own poetic, you know, justice. And kulam kedoshim. But what I'm trying to do is to be silent because we have no idea who the seventh beggar was or what the seventh beggar is. And Amir Tzashem, we should know them. Hei But what I want to talk about are three elements that are born out of not knowing, and then to talk about two possibilities that we find hidden within the annals of Breslov Chassidus throughout the generations that might give us a little bit of insight into the potential of what the legless beggar might be trying to convey to us by not existing. Throughout Chaim Haran, throughout, and Chaim Haran is one of the more profound books of Hasidus Breslov. Because Chaim Aharan, at least as we're aware, underwent a lot of censorship. There were a lot of parts of Chaim Aharan that were concealed deliberately to occlude the power of Rabbi Nachman, to occlude the story of Rabbi Nachman, to hide the world that is Rabbi Nachman. And thankfully, Tzadike Breslov and Gedoyeli Breslov came along and said, the time of redemption has come, at least for this particular element, and it's time to reveal the censored writings of, of, of Rabbi Nachman in Chaim Aharan. And throughout Chaim Aharan, what we find in numerous places is that Rabbi Nachman would come to Rabbi Nachman, and it was clear already, Rabbi Nachman reached a certain point in his disease with tuberculosis. We're talking about a young man of 38. Young man. Somebody who saw me, Saifa Olam and Saifa Olam, somebody who saw from the beginning of creation to the end of creation, but who lived a short amount of time, like our blind beggar. I am very, very old, but still I have not even begun to live. And when Rabbi Nassim would come over to his Rebbe and say, Rebbe, Rebbe, what's going to be with all of your haftachos? 
What's going to be with all of the promises you made? What's going to be with all of your visions and your prophecies of the future? What's going to be with your hope for redemption? What's going to be with the gift of hope that you offered us? You're leaving us. Rabbi Nassim writes that already by the first cough that Rabbi, Na- that Rabbi Nachman coughed after he had felt a little bit better and then he got sick again. Rabbi Nassim says that Rabbi Nachman, he first coughed and he says, this is my end. I'm going to die from this. So even Rabbi Nachman's disease was part of Rabbi Nachman's story. Even Rabbi Nachman's illness was part of his story. He knew. He knew the whole thing from the beginning. And Rabbi Nassim would say, Rebbe, Rebbe, what's going to be? And where Rabbi Nachman answers five or six times throughout Chaim Aran is, Gamarti ve'egmor. I have completed it, and I will complete it. I have finished, and I will finish. What Rabbi Nachman is teaching us over here, L'fianias daiti, is that there are two types of endings. There are endings that are apparent. There is the gamarti. There is when a person can say, or when Rabbi Nachman can say, I have finished telling the tale. I have told all there is to tell. I have told the story of the handless beggar. Gamarti, I'm done. There's nothing else to say. I have done what I have come to do. But then where Ibn Ahmed tries to breathe into our souls is the belief that Gamarti ve'egmor. I have finished. There's an ending that I have given you. But that is still not the true ending. There is still another ending that is born out of the ending that we first experience. Gamarti ve'egmor. I will tell the tale and I will end it. And then I will give birth and I will reveal to you that there is an ending even after things end. That when it comes and when it appears that things have ended, when it appears that the beggars who are buried are getting married in the pit, buried in the mud, when it appears that they've reached their ending, that they have finally gotten that last gift and that we're not going to hear of the legless beggar, Rabbi Nachman comes along and says there's still a deeper ending. That even when a person reaches the sof, even when a person feels that they have reached the end of things, that they have reached their limit, that they have reached the boundary at which possibility is possible anymore, where hope reaches its very last space that it can expand itself. The chiddush of Rabbi Nachman, that chiddush kamoni lohaya be'olam, that chiddush that never existed in the world prior to Rabbi Nachman, is that even when things end, even when we reach the limit, even when there's nothing else to be said, even when there's no more hope to be had, even when there's no longer a possibility of finding joy, there is still a possibility of finding joy. There is still a possibility of moving forward. There is still a possibility of completing things. So that the fact that Rabbi Nachman didn't tell the end of the story is on a certain level Rabbi Nachman telling us that I want you to encounter an ending. I want you to feel as if things have ended. I want you to feel, so to speak, as if there's a limit. You have reached the boundary where there is no more space to move forward. You have received the gift of the handless beggar and you won't receive anything else. And at that point, at that limit, at that place of concealment, at that gemar, at that point where Rabbi Nachman says, Gamarti, there's nothing left for me to tell you. You have reached the limit. I can't offer you any more hope. At this point, all you can do is recognize that it's forbidden to give up hope. Asur lehit yaish. Then Rabbi Nachman gives us a hint. And he hints to us, he intimates to us that the world is finally beginning to understand the tale of the legless beggar. That even at those points of ending, even at what appears to be the limit, what appears to be that point of despondency or loss of hope or unhappiness, Rabbi Nachman is offering us the possibility of a hope that lives beyond hopelessness, of an ending, or rather a beginning that begins after the ending of things, of sofo na'utz b'tchilaso, of when all things are closed down, when I say that I will not tell the tale anymore, 
Rabbi Nachman winks at us and he says, now it's your job to recognize that my ending is still not an ending. That even when you think things have ended, even when you think there's no more space to hope, even when you're so overwhelmed by everything that you hear on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis, where you're overcome with the desire to be mityaish, to lose hope, even when you fail in the isser that I announced, which is asur lehit yaish, then you can begin to understand the secret of ein shum yeish ba'olam klau. That losing hope doesn't exist. That endings don't exist. That an ending that I offer you is simply the birthplace of a new beginning that hasn't been told yet. That at that point of ending, where a person is forced to bow down to the fact that things are limited, that we can't know the ending of things, that we won't know the ending of things, that we don't know what comes tomorrow. There is the voice of Rabbi Nachman and the Torah of Atika Stima'a, the Torah of the ancient days, which are so ancient, they give birth to the future, which tell us that even when things end, there is a new beginning that waits after that ending. Gamarti ve'egmor. I have ended and I will continue to end. Or, as Rabbi Nachman said elsewhere, Nitzachti va'anatzeach. I have been victorious and I will be victorious. It's a paradox in terms. If I've been victorious, then what need is there to be more victorious? How can I have victory over things after I've already been victorious? Rabbi Nachman is telling us that don't bow down to false endings. Don't give in to that promise of hopelessness. Don't give in to that failure of hope. Recognize that even within hopelessness, there is a hope that survives hopelessness. There is an ending that exceeds endings. There is a gemira, there is a completion that survives even the initial completion of things. Now, like anything that Rabbi Nachman was doing, he was rooting himself on the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, on the Arizal, on the Torah of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and on the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu the Chamisha Tzadikei Hadoros, the five righteous individuals of the generations. We have this klal elsewhere. We have the concept of ad ve'ad v'chlal, ve'ad ve'loy ad v'chlal. Already in Meseches Brachos, the first Mesechta in Chazal, we have a discussion of two types of endings. There is reaching ad ve'loy ad v'chlal, reaching the limit, but not containing the limit within itself. And then there's another expression of ad ve'ad bichlal, of reaching the limit and then exceeding the limit and recognizing that the limit is simply a space that beckons for our recognition that there is no such thing as limits. That ad ve'ad bichlal is the gamarti ve'egmor. We have this as well even before we start learning Gemara, when a person begins learning the cantillation of the psukim, of how to lane the Torah, the ta'ame ha'mikra, we have a psik and a soif pasuk. There is a psik, which is the initial ending of things, and there's the soif pasuk when things are truly over. Again, beckoning to our awareness that even when things end, even when things appear to have reached their limit of our capacity, there is still more hope that exists. All we need to do is burst through those imaginary limitations that stand in front of us. That, on a certain simple level, could be perhaps what Rabbi Nachman is trying to tell us and what Rabbi Nassim is trying to convey to us with the ending that is not told. To remind us that even though the story is over, there is still a space that exceeds endings of things. The sof, the end of things, is the same language as a saf, as an edge. Like we see in Megillas Esther, which is the Sof Kol Hanisim, Purim, which is the end of all holidays because it exceeds the end of all holidays. We're told about Big Sun and Seresh, Shomre Hasaf, these two idol worshipping buffoons who create the entire space of the Purim miracle, that they guarded the Saf, they guarded the edge. Rav Tzadak HaKohen Melablin speaks about this that Sof and Saf, the end and the edge of things, share a very similar language. Okay, a lukute halachos just fell out of my head. (laughs) Okay.
the sof, the ending of things, is also the edge of things. It's also the space where we reach the limit. And here is where I want to transition now. Bezr Sashem, Bishus, Rabbi Nachman, Bishus, Rabbi Nassan, and Bishus, all of the tzaddikim of Breslov, not the chas v'shalom, try and add anything that wasn't said. Okay, two possible ideas. Two possible ideas that we can try and garner from the ending that is not told, from the legless beggar who b'mhera be'amenu we should find very soon. The first one, the first one is what we find a certain remez to. Now, this is not told from within Breslov itself. So, Lukuliamalo Fligi, that Breslov itself is not trying to say what the ending was. But Sadiqim of our generation, Rav Froman, Rav Steinsoltz, Rav Shagar, already hinted to the fact that potentially, like all the other beggars, what the legless beggar might potentially, possibly, in a world of infinite possibilities, of multiple realities, come to teach us is the power of dancing is the power of Rikud. Because it's possible to imagine that the legless beggar would say, and already it's okay because Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern Shlita and Rav Avram Svi Kluger Shlita point out that it's okay to say that the legless beggar will come along and say, you think I'm legless? You think I don't have legs? I have the greatest legs in the world. Already we have a Haskam, or I have a Haskam already from Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern, if anybody wants the Makor, I can share afterwards, as well as from Rav Avram Sli Kluger, Gedole HaTzadikim Shebedarenu Sheyizke Liyamim Toivim Va'aruchim. We already have enough of a Haskama from these Tzadikim to say that the legless beggar will announce that I have legs like nobody else. So if the legless beggar has legs like nobody else, what's he going to teach us to do? So there's already an echo or a hint of the fact that the legless beggar is going to teach us how to dance. That the legless beggar is going to come along and teach us how to dance. What's the connection between the legless beggar, the potential of the legless beggar, and the possibility of learning how to dance? So what people point down to, and I'm going to make a, a detour right now because we really haven't touched upon any symbolism of what Rabbi Nachman's stories might mean. We've tried to stay in the narrative. But for the sake of trying to give a little bit of insight into why certain people might think that the legless beggar is going to teach B'nai Yisrael how to dance properly, how to be marakid properly, we can look to the fact that the seven beggars that we encounter are going to correspond to the seven spheros, Chesed, Gvura, Kepheres, Netzach, Hoid, Yisoid, and Malchus, and Micah, forgive me. And these seven beggars are also going to correspond to the Shiva Haroim, of Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Yosef, Moshe, Aaron, and David. So if the first six beggars are the Midos of Chesed, Gvura, Teferas, Netzach, Hod, and Yesod, and if the first six beggars represent Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, and Yosef, then the seventh beggar represents the Mida of Malchus, and it represents the personality of David HaMelech, David Malka Mashiach. In order to understand Malchus, we have to understand that Malchus is impoverished. Malchus has nothing of its own. It is devoid of any content of its own. It is pure impoverishment. It is pure self-nullification. There's nothing there. There's nothing in the space of Malchus other than what is placed within it. Now what we're told about Malchus, what we're told about the concept of power, the concept of self, as it exists in exile, represented by David HaMelech, David HaMelech, who was able to say, Ki dalva ani ani, for I am poor and impoverished. I have nothing of my own. I am Evan Maasu Haboinim. I am the stone that is despised by the builders. Malchus, we're told, as it exists in Gullus, Ragleha Yardu Maves, her legs dangle in death that because it is the lowest rung of the ladder, <coughs> because it is the end of things where hope fizzles out or where light fizzles out, 
Ragleha Yardumaves, her legs dangle in darkness and they dangle in death. That there is a connection between the lowest level of things or the lowest expression of things or the ending of things and the ending that we all fear. That ending which is Misa, that ending of Ketz HaYamin, of Ketz HaYamin, the ending of days, the loss of hope, the loss of life, the loss of vitality. And as we exist in exile, those legs dangle in death. We walk upon death. Gam ki elech maves lo irara. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. That's where we walk. That's the derech that we live in. That's that derech that Rabbi Nachman decided to start telling stories on. That derech that was very well aware of the fact that death sat right on the other side. If we want to learn how to dance, if we want to learn the pure joy of dancing, the self-sacrifice that takes place to the ego in a moment of letting go and letting the body take over, letting the unconscious part of the self take over, we have to understand the depths of the impoverishment and the anxiety that emerge from living in this world. That when we live in this world, we're all made al hasaf we stand on the edge of things. Or like David HaMelech tells us, we dance on the abyss. We dance on the very unsturdy ground that at any moment threatens to erupt into nothingness. This is the story of David HaMelech and the Simchas Beis HaShoeva. That David HaMelech began to investigate the Tahom. David HaMelech began to investigate the depths that exist, the abyss that exists in the world from the six days of creation. And David HaMelech, in his wisdom and in his foolishness, in his holy foolishness, in his emuna, he says, let me investigate the abyss. And he makes a mistake and he opens the abyss and the abyss begins to threaten existence. The abysmal depths of nothingness that we stand upon threatens to swallow whole the promise of meaning and structure that we live with. And David HaMelech at that point has to say the tesva of those 15 shir hamalos to let the water go back down. And what we're told on the same daf in Masech HaSukkah is that the Simchas Beis HaShoeva, the dancing that takes place in the Beis HaMikdash, is the dancing of David HaMelech. That the dancing that we do is a dancing on the abyss. It's a dancing that is aware of how unsturdy the ground is. how we can never truly place two feet on the ground. We can at best place one foot on the ground. And then when that foot gets comfortable, we have to raise it as a result of anxiety only to place the second foot on the ground. And our existential awareness of the instability of reality is what gives birth to the dance of the Jewish people. That Rikud of David Malka Meshicha, that dance that David HaMelech dances at all times for all of us, the legs that dangle into the areas of death. And it was pointed out to me today that Rabbi Nassim hints to this. Rabbi Nassim says in Hilchos Piriya Verivya Halacha Gimel in Lukute Halachos, he says as follows, that when anybody, when any Jew, through their avoda and their serving of Hashem, elevates and allows joy to ascend from the depths of concealment, and they're capable of transforming their bitterness and their sighing and their loss of hope into joy, that is how we enlarge in and we embolden the joy to a point that simcha can finally be revealed in fullness from the depths of concealment. And where do the depths of concealment grab hold? They grab hold of the aspect of the lens. They grab hold of the lowest aspect of the body and the element of those legs dangle in death. And when we are able to elevate joy specifically out of darkness and hopelessness, and we're able to elevate our legs from within the klipos, at that point Mashiach comes. And at that point we're told that the legs of Mashiach, the ikvas of the Mashiach, the heels of Mashiach, will arrive on the mountain of Harazesim. This is the aspect that Rabbi Nachman spoke about so often, of our legs meeting the legs of Melech and Mashiach. 
It's specifically when we dance, when we elevate our legs out of darkness and out of concealment, out of hopelessness, and we draw them into a place of faith, that is the true joy. That is perhaps what the legless beggar is coming to teach us. That is perhaps what Davin Malka Mashiach might be coming to teach us. How to have hope even in hopelessness. How to live with the hope of an ending even when no ending arrives. Finally, and this is not found anywhere in the writings of Rabbi Nachman or Breslov, this is simply my humble suggestion or my humble hope. And this is very much based on a teaching of Rav Sadok HaKohen Meilblin, one of my favorite teachings in Machshavos Charutz, Os Yud Aleph. And Rabbi Nachman asks us in the beginning of the fifth Torah as well, that when the Yavanim, when the Chachmei Uma Sa'olam came to Bnei Yisrael, to the Chachamim, they said, you think you're so powerful, you think you're so great. Banalan avira ba'avira da, banalan besa ba'avira da'alma. Build us a house in the middle of the air. Show us, if you're so powerful, show us how to live in the sky. And what Tzadak HaKoyen Meleblin points out is that to live in the air is to live without truth, is to live without stability is to live without raglayim ladavar, is to live without a testimony that testifies to the veracity of things. It's to live in a space of suspended animation. It's to live in a space where we don't know. We have no ground to stand upon. We have no truth that we're able to grab hold of and say, this is what's going to carry us forward. But rather we're suspended in the air like a migdal haporeach ba'avir, like a tower that exists in the sky, unconnected to the ground. The Jewish people, Rav Tzadak HaKohen Melilblin points out, are those uniquely suited to live in the air, to be settled and satisfied with the fact that you're right, we don't know. We have no idea how our feet can touch the ground anymore. We have no idea where truth is going to come from. We have no idea where certainty is going to arrive from. But we're okay with that. We're okay without that certainty. We're okay without that testimony. We're okay without the raglayim ladavar. We're okay waiting. We're okay being patient, waiting for the legless beggar to arrive. We're okay floating in the air without any comfort whatsoever other than our emuna. Because if Rabbi Nachman's story of the Sheva HaBatlarim is coming to teach me anything, it's coming to teach me the power of emuna, the power of faith that exceeds the power of knowledge. The ability, as Rabbi Nachman said at the beginning, at the beginning of the beginning of the story, I will tell you how once upon a time they found joy from within despondency. I will tell you how we can find sturdy ground within the air. I can tell you how we can wait in the air, how we can dance in the air, how we can live in the abysmal space of not knowing and still find the Muna. That is Be'ezra Hashem, what Davin Malka Mashiach is going to come to teach us. How to dance on the abyss, how to dance on the edge, how to live sturdy without any ground to stand upon, how to live faithfully without any truth whatsoever to grab hold of, how to give ourselves the gifts of the Sheva HaBatlarim, of Emuna, of the promise to find faith within the pit, dug into the mud, covered in dirt and twigs and garbage, and to find the deep, deep joy of Emuna. That Emuna that doesn't need any legs to stand upon. That Emuna that doesn't need any testimony. And Be'ezr Sashem in the schus of living in the shadow of these beggars, of receiving the gifts of the six beggars and living in the fantasy of the seventh beggar. We should be zochet to the ikvus of the Meshicha. We should be zochet to truly walk on the steps and the air where we can find how to build lives and build houses suspended in midair, Be'ezrus Hashem.